and welcome to Meet the Author, a program that is brought to you by Quincy Access Television and the Thomas Crane Public Library. During this show, we will highlight authors and their work. Copies of their books are available for checkout at the Thomas Crane Public Library. Also, the library hosts book clubs for all ages, and you can find out more information about them if you visit the library's website, thomascranelibrary.org. I'm joined by retired Captain Tom Lyons, retired from the Quincy Fire Department. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, his authorship, his latest book, and it's about public safety, it's about fire safety. So, Captain, uh, welcome back. You are no stranger to Quincy Access Television. You have done um, quite a bit with us in your capacity at the Quincy Fire Department in the past. You're continuing uh, your, uh, I guess, quest to inform people about fire safety. So welcome, first of all. And, and uh, Mark, thank you. And I appreciate, the, um, I appreciate being here, as I have in the past, because I have a passion for um, fire safety, for fire prevention, especially where I experienced what I did experience in my 44-year career. We'll talk about that. Uh, talk about what led you to a career in fire safety. Well, interestingly enough, it started when I was a young boy. Uh, my grandfather was a, a Boston firefighter. My father was a firefighter in Quincy. And he would convey to me uh, the causes of certain incidents. Uh, this would have been, believe it or not, back into the 50s and 60s when smoke detectors didn't exist. And he would create, long before what you and I are familiar with, the EDITH program, an evacuation program. Uh, he would create an evacuation program for my siblings uh, within that home, which was so important because the smoke detectors didn't exist, so you never got earlier notification. In fact, if there was a fire in the house while you were sleeping. But in uh, 1978, consequently, because of the influence uh, within my family, I joined the Quincy Fire Department in Massachusetts. Um, half of my career, my career lasted around 33 years. I was a firefighter and lieutenant, once again experiencing the devastation of fire, the loss, the lives lost, etc. had a tremendous impact on me. And when I made captain, they asked me to manage the Fire Prevention Bureau for a city of 92,000. And I did so for the latter half of my career, where I, with members of my team, we attempted to eradicate fire, which, is, which would be impossible, to minimize the fires within our, within our city. And through enforcement, through inspections, and then it occurred to me that I grew up with an understanding of fire prevention innately and most people never had that experience or that exposure. So I decided to write with the cooperation of a local newspaper, the Quincy Sun. I wrote over 200 articles on the subject of fire safety and prevention. Um, that in turn evolved into you and I working. I believe we co-created 40 programs, PSAs, etc., which I understand are still occasionally shown. They are, and uh, we will get to those in just uh, a moment, just uh, a taste for folks. Yeah. Uh, talk about um, after you left Quincy, uh, you continued. I continued, and, and again, that has to do with a passion. And what happened, quite frankly, since 1978, a job became a vocation. It still is for me. This book is a part of that as well. Uh, I went on as the fire safety administrator at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston with 25 locations surrounding the general Boston area. Uh, I wrote there as well. Uh, my passion kept this 74-year-old man going. Um, no problem with that because I just, I just love serving. If you have a life of service, what, what, what better is there? We will go to a piece, kind of a compilation of what was done here at Quincy Access Television. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to start uh, with asking you and folks in the book, they'll find this out, what the number one residential fire is currently. Currently, it is cooking. And it's interesting thing about statistics. It all depends upon what types of fire you group to determine those statistics. Because you can, the US Fire Administration will tell you that it's electrical fire is the most common. 
most other agencies, and that's because they include portable space heaters in electrical fires. Um, most uh, reporting systems like MIFRS in Massachusetts and the NFPA system, they will tell you that it is cooking. The interesting thing about a statistics, you go back 12 or 13 years, 60% of those cooking fires were caused because cooking was left unattended. Now those numbers are 49%. But the fact of the matter is cooking is something to be concerned about and, um, and those statistics on those fires change, uh, can change considerably. Well, actually, uh, both of these pieces, which uh, folks will see in just a minute, both are featured or feature cooking, mm -hmm. one inside the house and one outside. So we'll go to um, those, just a, kind of a, a snippet of what was produced here at Quincy Access Television with uh, Captain Tom Lyons. We will come back into the studio and continue our conversation in just a moment. Captain, we are in a kitchen, mm -hmm. and we are in front of a stove, and there's a few things that you can tell us about um, cooking. Well, you know, to start with, there's no better time spent, I think, than creating good fire prevention habits. And that's just what they are, they're habits. There are things that you can change, there's behavioral habits that you can change that can impact your life in a positive way. Now, for instance, Having come in this kitchen, I saw that the homeowner, uh, she had um, the tea kettle and pans. None of them are on the burners. So in the event that one of these burners was left on, uh, you know, being aluminum or an alloy, they could, uh, they, they could have melted. So this is a safer scene having someone left. If in fact uh, one of these were turned on, there were no pans, no pans actually on the, on the burners. Ah, just a couple minutes more and it will be perfect. There's nothing like the summertime in cooking outdoors. Oh, hi. I'm Captain Tom Lyons of the Quincy Fire Department, here to discuss grill safety while I prepare a great meal using one. First, start the season by making certain your grill is ready for a long season of use. Check the hose connections for tightness and the hoses themselves for any cracking and weather wear. Make certain the tubing to the heating element isn't clogged by debris and clean the grill of excess grease. Well, there you have it. Uh, just a, really just a sample of what was done here at Quincy Access Television with the Quincy Fire Department and Captain Tom Lyons. Uh, there's a couple things you want to expand upon cooking, which I think is great because that was one of the, uh, that we actually led with that, showing the piece. No, absolutely, and it is the most common cause of fire. In the book, there is a story about a woman I had an occasion to visit. She was in a small condo, roughly around 550 square feet. Uh, she was an avid reader. And on top of her stove, she had a stack of the New York Times over covering two burners. So very nicely, um, I, I suggested that this is something you shouldn't do. That's a behavioral pattern that's going to lead you to the occasion of fire. So she removed them, and I knew she removed them uh, in the future because she contacted me a couple of months later and said, Captain, I am so grateful you told me about that because I went to work the other day, I left the stove on. Now, there was a behavioral pattern that was innate to her. It was habit. She was willing to change, and it saved her from the devastation of a fire. And that's the motivation of, of the book. For the reader to measure themselves, their own habits, the, their own behavioral patterns against healthy uh, behavioral patterns that will minimize the chances that you will encounter a fire. That public service announcement, which was about grill safety, oh, we should also great. mention that that won a national award. So congrats to you. Uh, that was you. That looked like you, right? It to just us. didn't have a nose. Without the nose. <laughs> And there were all sorts of comments. Everybody loved the content. Uh, they learned by it. You would hear so well. I didn't know that. But they said, what, what, where's the nose? Where's the nose? You looked better without the nose. Oh, thank you, very much. Oh, thank you very much. A nose is very hard to draw. My wife might agree with you, by the way. But, <laughs> but and I think one of the things about that uh, public service announcement was it was important information, but it was delivered in such, such a lighthearted manner as to make maybe a greater impact or an impact of a different kind? 
Yeah, and I agree. I think it's, it's the flavor that I usually share these messages with, and I truly mean that. I've gotten feedback about the book, and I, I hear terms of uh, a folksy style. Someone suggested, seriously, that I was sitting in a rocker on a porch, and you were conveying the wisdom of a safer household uh, via that method. And, and I actually had other feedback that I'd like to read later, and it suggests the same. So um, that, uh, that PSA was extremely well received, and I think it had a very important message, and uh, grateful to this day that, in fact, we co-created it. Well, let's go directly to the book now. It's called Fighting Fire, A Proactive Approach. Talk about, um, I suppose, the process involved in putting this book together. Well, what happened is, if you recall, last July it was extremely dry, extremely dry weather. And down in Hingham, Massachusetts, there was a fire in a home. Now, whether it was just totally renovated or it was newly built, well, it was no sooner near completion, and it's been alleged that carelessly disposed of smoking materials started the fire from outside the building, and it was a total loss. Um, around that same time, there was uh, the oldest existing hotel in Nantucket, I believe, the Veranda House Hotel. That burnt down. The cause? Careless disposal. And lastly, in Quincy, Massachusetts, we had the Bigelow Street fire. And although it was left undetermined, it was obvious that it started outside the building. And what occurred to me at that time, and meanwhile, these fires aren't unusual considering the dryness, the dryness of mulch, the dryness of vegetation around the sill of a house. But it occurred to me, and I had just retired from um, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, that every article I wrote in and around 2010, et cetera, of over 200, they're all still relevant. They're all relevant. And um, still living the passion and the vocation I have, I decided to compile those articles. I think I roughly chose 69 out of 200 um, to compile them in a book uh, for the reader because it, it, I, there's valuable information and I just didn't want it to die away, to die away. So talk about the layout of the book and how the book is, I suppose, best used. Yeah, I suggest it is, it by no means is it a novel where you'll read, uh, read it from cover to cover. Um, I see it particularly applicable to seniors, to applicable to uh, parents with young families, applicable to new firefighters. New firefighters have very little exposure to code. They're all about learning and being trained in suppression uh, activities, medical assists, etc. And for the homeowner, I see this as a book that you would have next to your recliner. If there's nothing on TV, you would pick it up, read three articles in a certain area that might interest you, whether it be dryer fires, etc. But let me emphasize, there's nothing in that book that is meant to frighten anybody. It's all about building an awareness to change uh, behavioral habits. The most frightening part of the book is actually, I think, the cover with the flames in the back. And the reason it was designed that way, because that helmet is my father's helmet. And I, he was obviously in the fire department and I wanted his hand in this book as well. Fire should be, I think you've said this in the past, fire should be respected. In other words, the use of a fireplace, the use of combustibles, right? Yes, fire is a part of, of our lives. But it's when we don't respect it or understand it that it becomes a problem. That's absolutely right. And in the new age of appliances, et cetera, it's a particularly important. And what you're doing, I remember you're retrieving a conversation we had years ago on, on, on tape. And, you know, in my father's time, my grandfather's time, flame was, was everywhere. It was in your stove. They had uh, fuel oil for their stove. They had candles, etc., etc. And with the new appliances we have, with the sophistication of flashlights, um, generators, etc., uh, fire is not as uh, familiar to us as it once was. So consequently, and there have been fatalities this way, I mention them in the book, People will, they lose power, or for atmosphere, they'll have a candle, a lit candle, and they forget about it. Um, 
other sources of fire, um, even wood stoves. There's mention in the book, in fact, it, it refers to Benjamin Franklin. And as the firefighters... Who you've never met. Who I've never met, because the firefighters in my office said, did you know him, Cap? Um, and, and the fires that he was concerned about then, I think, uh, are less familiar to people now, and yet they still occur. They still occur. One of the stories in the book, which I thought was a very interesting way to uh, prove a point, was a fire that started in a basement, ended up melting the soldering material yeah. on the water pipe and fortunately water came and suppressed that fire and I believe a child was involved or a young a young kid he was involved in 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 my let's say 33 career it is exceptional that I should encounter such a fire and if you can picture this walking down the stairway into a basement above your head is a smoke detector exactly where it should be but the cover is hanging off, there's no battery in it. The basement is finished. To the left you have a hollow core door with no fire rating and there's a furnace inside that door. You walk down a panel corridor and it opens up to a bedroom. The windows in that bedroom did not conform as emergency egresses. For instance, in order for a window to, uh, to, to be uh, determined to be a, an emergency egress, it has to have certain dimensions. It can't be any higher than 42, at the highest, 44 inches, 42 inches ideally off of the basement floor. The opening must be um, 20 inches in width and 24 inches in height. Those windows weren't conducive to that whatsoever. So what happened in the middle of the night, there was a young boy living in this basement, and what happened is there was a fire in the furnace room. So now you had smoke migrating throughout that basement. That didn't wake the child up. Eventually what happened, which is incredibly rare, is that fire got hot enough at a weak spot and it melted the solder. The joint came apart. The rushing water acted as if it was a sprinkler head and suppressed the fire somewhat, controlled it. It was the rushing of the water that woke the boy up Within the smoke condition, he evacuated and noticed and notified the, the others in the home. Incredible. Incredible. And we should mention that the book features stories just like that to make a point. Yep. Another one that I do just want to touch upon briefly, we were talking about this uh, as I was setting the stage, was the dryer right. fire. And it occurred not where you would think it would have occurred. Exactly. And the fire marshal at that time, during that fire, in one of the articles, and it is included in the book, has to do with um, uh, dryer maintenance. And it's recommended that that vent piping be checked, removed and be checked. Because particularly if it comes out of the dryer at a right angle, that constant heat can burn a hole there. The vent pipe becomes ragged and collects um, a lint there. Um, the fire marshal at the time recommended taking the back off of the dryer once a year. Well, I myself, I, I haven't done it, quite frankly, and I thought it was a little over the top. However, we did have a fire, and the fire was contained within the mechanism of the dryer itself. And if, if that, those individuals perform that preventive maintenance, as the fire marshal had suggested, remove the back, clean that area out, where the belt is, et cetera, that that fire would not have occurred. The last uh, piece I would like to touch upon, because I think it occurred in multiple instances, multiple articles, is the oxygen-rich environment that could be created and um, how that can really cause loss of life, devastation. I can, um, I've had firsthand three fires in oxygen-rich atmosphere. Um, at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in the procedure room, yearly I used to train the clinical staff. And I used to tell them that they, they, there would be procedures in oxygen-rich atmosphere. The flame would come across to them immediately in a surreal. It would be surreal to them. So they had to act appropriately. Um, in terms of one fire uh, in the city of Quincy, um, 
there was a woman I spoke to, management of the building spoke to, I wrote to her, management wrote to her, and she had a small cylinder of oxygen. She was dependent upon 24-7. She was a smoker. Now, the fire marshal recommended if you're still going to smoke on uh, home health aid oxygen, remove the cannula, go outside, whether it be a balcony, etc., and smoke there. This woman wouldn't have it. And she smoked with the cannula one night. And you have to understand, when you have an oxygen-rich atmosphere, that sofa is saturated with oxygen. Your clothing is saturated with oxygen. Even if the material is flame retardant. Even if you could potentially have a fire in flame retardant uh, material. And items will burn far more intensely and rapidly. You'll, t you'll take a match and it'll be a, a small blowtorch. That night, she was engulfed immediately, absolutely immediately. And she succumbed to that fire. Now, I went back to that house, that, that building, they asked me to come back and give a presentation. And I, within that presentation, I said to those attendees, I said, you won't be able to say fire extinguisher before you'll be engulfed in a fire if you smoke with a nasal cannula. I repeated it three times. I left. My partner overheard a woman with a nasal cannula, and she said, I am all set. I have a fire extinguisher. So there's a level of denial there that is extremely hard to break through. This point might be obvious, or this question might be obvious, but what um, would you like folks to gather from reading the book? Well, I think there's three aspects, and, and I've thought about this before. And the number one thing is to, to increase their awareness. I should have titled the book, Be Aware and Not in Fear, quite frankly. Um, measure your, your behavioral habits to what you see in, these, in this book. The other thing is to um, proper notification, detectors in proper locations, the proper type, Smoke detector, uh, the, they have evolved so much and the codes have evolved so much. Make sure you have them in the right location, they're working, including carbon monoxide detectors in this state. Um, and I have a great story if, if, if we have time. And thirdly is, all the fatalities I've witnessed in the fire service, there was absolutely, and I studied every fire I ever came across, there was no forethought to what do I do in the event of a fire? If my primary means of evacuating this building, which is typically the one they leave from Sunday to Monday, if I can't, if I can't proceed that way, what else do I do? And I had a, a, a fire. Um, it flashed over in a second bedroom. Rather than opening the window to grade level, Two yards away from his bed, he decided to put his pants on. The fire flash, he dropped one breath because he was going to walk down the stairwell. And he could have evacuated out of that, uh, out of that window. I want people to, I encourage them to think of other means that they can, they can escape. The book is just full of safety tips and often repeated because this book is a compilation of articles. Repetition is is great and the way it, it works in the book is just that it works but you discovered eventually the reason behind that because one article might the second article might give you more or might i look i always say it this way it approaches the mountain from a different angle and you'll get a little more different information from that article and possibly the next article as well let's talk about feedback i love the feedback because um um, you put so much of an effort in this book and you want to be validated, but you also want to amend it if need be, um, according to the writer's uh, feedback. Um, this is from a chief of a city fire department. Cap, I've read a good portion of your book and I think it's awesome. Lots of great information and delivered in short stories. And that's the intent of it. It's, the intent isn't overwhelmed. Nobody is going to go and take an NFPA standard and read it cover to cover. This is a book far lighter um, as informational 
but it can be read in, in spurts, if you will. Um, this feedback was from an engineer, a fire engineer up in upstate New York. Tom, thank you very much. I can hardly put it down. The personal touch to the information is wonderful. The NFPA should know about your book. There is something about how it is written, that folksy approach. I call it the personal touch. And lastly, uh, the content of your book is really incredible. This should be a must read in high schools and colleges, never mind in firefighter training. And I believe that. Every high school student, et cetera, in college, et cetera, they're eventually gonna live in the home. Something as like this, the contents of this book is never touched upon in an elective in a college, where in fact, the seeds could be planted for these individuals to have a, self, a, a safer home. Um, so there you go, I, I was grateful for these. And we should mention that there is actually an article in the book about college safety. About colleges, I, 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 I've, I've witnessed some of these off-campus housings and my eyes roll. And there are articles, there are many articles just beyond household fire safety. I wish I had some that I could touch upon. Um, and off-campus housing included. I mean, some of these l landlords in these, I, I've seen them out of state, quite frankly, and where they put some of these kids is unacceptable. I think the years that um, you served in this, in relation to fire safety, whether it was as a firefighter, firefighter educator, uh, an educator at um, Dana-Farber, Dana yeah. I think all that lends itself to really making contact with folks. Oh, I, 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 I do. I, I miss it tremendously. I used to give thousands of presentations at Dana-Farber, and I encourage questions. I encourage questions. And I would attempt, and what you and I haven't discussed, there's an optimistic wish out there with people and it's pretty innate that people say, you know, it's not gonna happen to me. I try to bridge that gap to suggest that, you know something, I've witnessed the fact that it can happen. That's my frustration. But here's all you have to do to minimize its occurrence or how to address it or to evacuate a fire should it occur. So I love those opportunities. You know the people who are the most enthused about those presentations? were the people who have experienced fire. It was real to them. And every presentation, they would come up to the auditorium, they would come up to the, to the uh, head of the stage, and they wanted to convey their message. I'm glad you said that because no one is immune. No one is immune. You, you, you're absolutely right. That's why I get so frustration. And much of my energy, I think, comes from that frustration because so many of these fires are senseless, senseless. You and I could sit down and go through every fire in this book without conveying fear, but conveying practical behavioral patterns to avoid the mistakes that others have made. Practical behavioral patterns. Yes. Well yeah. said. I want to congratulate you on writing the book. Thank Again, you. Again, a great read for folks. And um, I really want to congratulate you and thank you for your efforts in your whole career. Yeah, I, I've lived this. I appreciate this. If you can connect with something and a job becomes a vocation, you're one lucky individual. And um, uh, the passion is still there. I'm not giving up, obviously. And I hope to still contribute uh, elsewhere. But meanwhile, I'm very, very grateful for all the work you and I have done. I think it's made a tremendous impact on the city of Quincy. I genuinely do. And um, thank you for having me today. And lastly, there is a website where folks can contact you. Thanks again for joining me. Thank you, Mike. And writing a great book. Thanks so much.